Welcome, everyone. Here we are with the sports writers again this week. Phil Stacy, Matt Williams of the Salem News, Nick Giannino from the uh, Gloucester Times here covering North Shore sports. And uh, we're in the MIAA tournaments for sure. Some teams eliminated, some teams continuing on. We'll get to that story about those teams continuing on here in just a few moments. But, uh, Phil, let me begin with you and have you kind of summarize or update for us some of what has happened uh, from uh, North Shore hockey I know you've been, uh, of course, for years covering uh, closely St. John's Prep, and they seem to uh, getting their stride together, if you will, for the postseason with their goal scoring and uh, moving on here in the tournament. Yeah, I mean, I don't think uh, reaching the quarterfinals is any great accomplishment that they hang their hats on. They certainly expect to, you know, for me to honor they expect to be at the Garden uh, for the finals. So, this is just taking care of business one game at a time, doing what they're supposed to be doing, doing what they've been um, focused on all season is winning when the postseason comes. Um, you know, admittedly, a very sloppy opener. Yes, they won it, but they didn't look particularly sharp in doing so. Um, near complete 180 on Saturday against Wellesley. 7-1, uh, pretty thorough win. Um, two goals the first one minute, seven seconds, and then four goals to blow it open in the second period. Really, really played well. Limited shots, attacked the net, got secondary scoring, played well along the walls. Um, a lot of depth guys contributed. You had Cooper Hosmer, a sophomore, with a couple of goals and an assist. You had Captain Jake Vanna with a couple of goals. Uh, defense played much better than they had in the opener. Uh, Brady Plaza was looking good. Jack Doherty was looking good. Uh, J.R. Goldstein, some of these guys. So um, they're in a good spot. We still don't know yet who their quarterfinal opponent will be. That will be decided uh, tonight, Monday night. It's the last of the second-round hockey games. And it will be a test. Um, you're either going to face eighth-seeded Hingham, which uh, defeated the prep on opening day, 3-2. to two. Now, granted, both teams are remarkably different since then. But the fact of the matter remains, they beat St. John. I was worried about this seeing Phil froze up here a moment ago, but his voice continued here. Um, Phil, maybe you're back with us now. I don't yeah, think you, I am. You, your, your um, audio just stopped, but uh, that was just uh, where were we here when he. Uh, no, I was just saying St. John's will play either Hingham or right. Braintree, uh, depending on who wins that game tonight. Hingham is number eight seed. Uh, they beat St. John's Prep earlier. Um, that start the season three to two at, Essex, at uh, the Essex Sports Center. So um, while I think both teams are different, you know, Hingham does have that over St. John's Prep. And Braintree, you know, um, had a uh, tremendous game against St. John's two years ago in the playoffs. And I realize a lot of the names and faces have changed from two years ago, but they really gave the prep all they could handle two years ago. So I think St. John's is very mindful that um, they are a strong team as well. So whoever the prep's opponent will be Thursday night in Stoneham, um, will certainly give them their first true test of the postseason, I would say. Any other hockey? Where do you want to take it from there, Phil and Nick and Matt, actually? Uh, all have been at rinks here in the last uh, three or four days. Well, I would say uh, a team we have yet to see yet in the postseason, but is still alive. Maskinomit is playing some great hockey right now. The boys um, – Fresh off of a, I mean, you got to call it an upset. They went down the road, uh, down to Randolph, and beat the defending state champions from Canton High School, number two seed Canton, on the road, four to two. They were down uh, two to one with just about, uh, you know, four minutes to go, a little over four minutes to go. And, uh, you know, they make a comeback and they win in regulation. Uh, Anthony Cerboni, the um, captain defenseman, ties it up. Johnny Moreau gives them a go-ahead goal, um, picked off a pass in the offensive zone with about 220 left and scored. And then um, Ben Merrill, excuse me, scored the second of his two goals into an empty net to win it. Uh, Chris Sacco, another captain, goaltender with 36 saves. I believe he has 73 saves in the first two playoff games. So Masco is clearly playing with house money. They don't want to look at it that way. They want to look at it like, hey, yeah, we're better than what our seating was.
I know Phil froze again on us here, but, uh, you know, I think it came up in last week's podcast, uh, Phil, you were talking about their defense, but they got that act together, huh? Yeah, I don't know why this keeps going out. Sorry about that. I tried shutting down my VPN here. Maybe that'll help. Um, yeah, their, their defense is playing really well. Uh, now they're going up against the Ducks Free team again. Two years ago, beat them in the playoffs. Uh, Ducks Free is a 10 seed. Looks like a fairly even matchup for Masco. So that'll be interesting. They actually precede the prep game Thursday at um, Stoneham. So um, that's, that's a good doubleheader for North Shore hockey fans, Thursday in Stoneham. Definitely. Nick G, I know you were at the, um, I believe you were at the Gloucester game over the weekend, uh, uh, Gloucester Newburyport game. And uh, what can you share with us on that game? Well, it was a hell of a battle, right? Uh, the teams obviously know each other. They have a history of, uh, you know, a little bit of a rivalry that's kind of been renewed this year, you know, with Gloucester playing so well and Newburyport being at the top of their game, getting a high seed in the tournament. Um, place was packed over at Graff Rink. So, just a really fun game to be at, really physical, a lot of hard hits, uh, fast-paced, and could have went either way. You know, it ended up being a 4-2 win for Newburyport, but they got a empty netter in the, literally the final second of the game to make it a 4-2 game. So uh, it was close all the way through. Gloucester let up a, a tough one early on um, where Newburyport, you know, kind of slapped out a shot but didn't really get a, a clean stick on it, and it kind of rolled in five hole. Uh, looked like the goalie might have been screened a little bit, so that was tough to fall down one nothing. But they get it right back on a five on three with Colby Jewell, um, who just played an excellent game. He took some really big hits. I thought he might not come back in late in the game, but he did. Um, and he, yeah, he had a great goal to tie it up, and then they fell fell behind two one. Tied it up again on on a goal from Chris Carvalis, um, who really played some excellent hockey as well down the regular season stretch. You know, Coach Derek Geary was looking for that other guy to to really chip in uh, alongside Brett Cunningham and Colby Jewell. They're two stars, they're two senior stars, and Carvalis I thought really stepped up. Um, you know, he he that goal he had against Newburyport followed his own miss and and put it home. So. Um, tied it up 2-2, and then Newburyport got the uh, the game winner, the third goal in the third midway through the third, and Gloucester kept pressing. They had their chances, but just couldn't get that final goal to to send it to overtime. And Newburyport put uh, put in the uh, empty netter. So, but great battle over there, great season for Gloucester. Um, like I said, it could have gone either way. You know, Gloucester had beaten Newburyport earlier in the year, five to two which I thought was uh, closer than the final score suggested. And obviously Newburyport was out for a little bit of revenge in the playoffs at home and turned into be a really good game. So I uh, can't knock either team there. And even the Newburyport coach said after, he's like, yeah, that, that one could have went either way. I feel for Gloucester, uh, you know, just a couple pucks bounced our way tonight. So uh, that was a fun one. And then uh, I will just touch on Rockport real quick. They had a nice, season for themselves uh, getting into the the tournament this year and really uh, battled with a, a good Stoneham team number 10 seed in division four on the road uh, they fell down three nothing in the first period and you know talking to coach Garrett Stevens all three of those goals were off deflections or redirects so kind of an unfortunate uh, sequence of puck luck there to, to open things up and fell down three nothing but battled back and Ultimately ended up losing four to two. Um, and then that Stoneham team went on and, and beat number seven, Wilmington, six, nothing. So you got to like what, how Rockport competed in that one. And uh, I thought, you know, they had a tough schedule this year. They only finished with seven wins, but uh, that easily could have been a 10, 11, 12 win team um, if they, if they faced some different teams, but uh, good season for them too. And then on the girls side, Gloucester girls bowed out um, down in, was it Duxbury? I believe, uh, yeah. Two they, they, I don't know whether it was played. Yeah, right. Yeah, so they uh, they just missed out on a home game, getting the 17 seed, beat Walpole on the road, a good Walpole team, four to two, and then had to go out to the top seed in Duxbury, and and they they hung around. You know, it was a close game for a while. They battled and ultimately ended up losing four to one. Obviously, uh, you know, can't blame them going on the road against a 19 and three team that's the top seed in the bracket. That was a tall task, but uh, I thought it was an excellent season for, for Gloucester hockey, girls hockey, and I'm sure Willie can expand on that a little bit, but kind of a historic year for them, right? Um, 
just started the program back up four years ago and now to get into the sweet 16 of the playoffs and finish with uh i think 14 wins yeah 14 wins they had good win over uh, winthrop this year for them yeah they yeah winthrop. yeah so uh that program's heading in the right right direction for sure well i think that's a nice little lead into you uh and i, I don't know if we want to continue on with girls hockey but i know the uh the Peabody girls uh, picked up their second tournament win over the weekend as well on Sunday, actually yesterday. So uh, they're rolling along, but uh, all tight games for them, obviously so far. Yeah. As Nick mentioned, uh, so Duxbury, uh, the number one seed in division two, they beat the number one seed in division one, Notre Dame Academy, which is Peabody's next opponent. So uh, that just goes to show you how good Duxbury is. There's no shame in, in Gloucester in that one. I mean, if there was a girls super eight, uh, there's no question Duxbury would be in it. Right. So, uh, so, so Peabody, uh, you know, getting back to them, they, they win tight games, uh, you know, exactly what was expected against Pope Francis, two very good defensive teams, well-coached teams, button down, you know, cautious, uh, shots on goal were 20 to 20, very even, you know, this was not going to be a wide open run and gun, you know, game with, with crazy saves, uh, everything was going to be earned. And, and I think it was well worth the, price of admission and and well worth the trip uh, out to Springfield and and Peabody got the bounces and, and won the game two to one. And I expect a very similar game against ND Hingham. Um, you know, they're a team that is independent, has played all the big guns, uh, your St. Mary's, your Duxbury, as I mentioned, uh, teams like this, uh, you know, they average about two and a half goals a game. Uh, their leading score has 22 points. So, they're not a team that is, you know, has a, a, a offensive a firepower, a, a, a Sammy Tabor, a Julia Masada, one of these, you know, all-time great players that's going to come out and light you up. I, I expect another tight checking game, you know, within one goal or two. And, you know, the good thing for Peabody is they've been in these games, right? They're not going to get nervous. They're not going to grip their sticks or panic if they're in a tight game. I mean, you know, they're holding a one to nothing lead, on Sunday and they get whistled for a couple of penalties. They give up a five on three goal to tie the game. And at this point, you know, uh, Pope Francis still has about a hundred seconds of five on four time left. So you've already tied the game. Now you've got to kill this penalty to make sure you fall behind. And Peabody was able to do that, was able to relax and steady themselves. And uh, about 45 seconds after the penalty expired, they come down on a rush get a wraparound bid, get the puck to pop out to the slot and pop it in and retake the lead. So just a crazy third period. That doesn't even get into the penalties at the end of the game. Peabody's nursing a one goal lead. Pope Francis takes a penalty with 248 to go. So you say, okay, you know, by the time it gets even, there's only 40 seconds left. We're in really good shape here, but they get a bad bounce. A girl falls down, reaches forward with her stick. A girl trips over the stick. It wasn't like, an, you know, it was a good call, a, a clean trip. But, you know, it wasn't like a, a purposeful trip where you didn't have the puck. So that made it four on four for a little while. Uh, you know, uh, uh, then Peabody took another penalty with only five seconds left. Uh, <laughs> Pope Francis pulled the goalie. So for five seconds, you had six Pope Francis skaters, only three for Peabody. So, I mean, granted, it's only five seconds. You don't really have time to do anything or, or make that too dangerous. But... That just goes to show you how crazy a, a game it was. And uh, it, it was very entertaining. My hat's off to Pope Francis. I mean, they're only three years old uh, as a team. Their, their coach, Chris Carroll, used to coach uh, Saugus High, yeah. I believe. You know, is a, is a really good guy. He's got his girls playing very well. I was yeah, he's a real good guy. Very impressed with their goaltender, uh, Felix Gokul. She's she's a small kid. They call her the cat, obviously, because of Felix Potvin. But she, she fits <laughs> the bill because she's very small, but she's very quick. Uh, very tough to beat. So it was just a great game. Hats off to Peabody. Um, you know, the crazy thing is they've won two playoff games. Their leading scorer, Ava Buckley, is still sitting on 39 points. She she goes to the playoffs sitting on 39 points. You think, all right, she's going to get 40, you know, be join this sort of elite 40-point club. They've only had one other player hit 40, you know, in their program history. And they've managed to win two playoff games without her getting on the score sheet, which is pretty remarkable. Um, so... You know, for them, I mean, it's a really quick turnaround. No practice today. They get one practice Tuesday. They got to play on Wednesday. Uh, so, so no, no rest for the for the weary here. But, um, you know, again, I, I expect a really tight, 
uh, a game against Notre Dame very similar to what we saw uh, on Sunday. And, you know, if nothing else, it should be very entertaining. Hey, Willie, let me follow up. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, Nick, did you get the Felix the Cat reference there? No, I didn't. I was trying to pull <laughs> that one out, but I couldn't couldn't get to the bottom of it. I did not expect that Cat reference. That's a nice reference, definitely for sure. Uh, Nick, when we get offline, look up uh, Felix Pot Van. <laughs> All right. All right. All right. Let me, uh, well, let me follow up with you, Matt, because you and I were both at their Peabody's first game, the Winchester game, the 2 1 win, and Elise mm -hmm. Muddy was outstanding in that. They were outshot, was Peabody in that game by yeah, Winchester. So, yeah. so that's a nice little weapon back in goal that uh, Peabody has for them themselves this year is some pretty solid goaltending. Well, it was almost like she hasn't been tested. And that was almost the question was like, they've outshot so many of their opponents. I mean, her save percentage is pretty good. But if you look at her total number of saves, you know, compared to kids like Caden Cusimano out in Gloucester or, um, you know, some of the other top goalies in the area, Piper Davkos at Pingree, you know, her, her total saves were, were down and she just hadn't been asked to steal any games. And, um, you know, she, she had two kind of, three kind of rough games, you, you know, gave up three goals and a six, three win over Shawsheen, uh, gave up three to St. Mary's and then gave up three and a 10 to three win over Newburyport. And it's like, those games get away from you. They get out of hand. You don't see too many shots. It's hard to get engaged. I mean, since then she's given up one, zero, 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 two, zero, and one. So, I mean, the last, whatever that is, nine, 10 games, she's been locked in. You're talking shutouts in, what, four out of the last seven starts. Um, so I think, honestly, if they go on a run, if they beat Notre Dame and, and they go to the Garden, they're going to look back at that Winchester game and say, you know what, yeah. maybe that wasn't the worst thing because we got Elise going. We we got Elise feeling like she was Superman back there, you know. Um, I, I don't, you know, it, it didn't feel good in the moment. But I think big picture, when you kind of get your goalie to lock in that way, um, that could be a good thing, really, all things considered. Yeah, it felt good right after the game, that's for sure. You know, once yeah, they got the, yeah, once they got the, the W. Yeah. Off in the defensive zone, I think they didn't feel too good. They, they probably felt like they were going to throw up. But, you know, <laughs> with the benefit of hindsight, you can say, you know what, like getting her in the zone, uh, that's what's going to help us uh, win a championship if, if you know, if that's what's in the cards here. Um, you know, and, and you got to shout out their defense too. I'm going to do a little story. People can read that as just, just a little preview, but they really only had one defenseman come back that played big minutes last year. And they, they've had some new kids really step up into those important roles. That was their biggest question mark coming into the season. And, uh, you know, you got to shout out kids like Daniela White and, and Eleni Spack, who are multi-sport athletes who really raised their game to a to a new level uh uh and really filled big minutes that were that were back there on the blue line for that team mac give a little shout out to coach michelle roach she used to listen to this podcast if i remember right but uh who knows if she does anymore but we should give her a little shout out for the for the big two playoff wins so far she's done reasonably well i mean it's funny <laughs> she was uh before the game she was uh discussing the timeouts uh with uh some of her assistants they they were you know, kind of going back and forth on whether they should have taken the time out in the position that they did against Winchester. And uh, it was funny that that ended up coming up in this game because Pope Francis took its time out when it took the penalty with 248 to go, which meant on the faceoff on the six on three with five seconds left, it was up to Peabody. Do we take a time out and relax and try to calm everything down? But then the inverse of that is it allows Pope to maybe draw up a play so they decided to let it ride, not take the time out. And, uh, you know, it ended up working out for them. That was one of those interesting kind of game within a game things that I think sometimes gets lost, right, in all the excitement. But I, I thought that was sort of an interesting little piece of strategy there. I think it's a good call on their part. All right. No, I, uh, I mean, yeah. I, I actually didn't I didn't agree with the timeout they took uh, in, against Winchester. So, <laughs> you know. Didn't they take the second timeout, though, in the Winchester game after Winchester took one ahead earlier? Well, they took it. Um, they took it on a defensive zone draw, which I just, I, as philosophically, I think you want to take your time out on an ozone draw. I mean, on a D zone draw, you're you're sort of. Get, I mean, even though they wanted to rest their defensemen, you're kind of letting the other team's uh, best scorers rest and and maybe think about what they want to do. So, me personally, I, I don't like to do that. I don't know what Phil thinks, but me, I'm always <laughs> the ozone draw guy. 
Well, I will, I will apologize right now to Coach Roach as we speak here, but uh, we're bringing that up. All right. Um, gentlemen, let's go to hoops. Let's uh, do a quick little thing here. I'm looking at the clock here, and I know we we're, we got to zero in on very quickly some some basketball thoughts here from you guys. I can jump in. Sure. But we'll talk about Cape Ann because I got two teams left from the Cape Ann area that are still in the playoffs and they're both boys basketball teams. Um, I guess we'll, we'll, we'll begin with Manchester. They are uh, now 20 and one on the year. Got off to a little bit of a slow start in their uh, home opener against Frontier Regional the other night. Um, I think they were down 17, 15 after the first quarter, but that's kind of been a trend for this team where they're really first quarter. They're just kind of figuring out what the other team's trying to do, what's going to work well uh, in terms of a game plan. And um, from there, they just turned it on, picked it up defensively. Cade first had 28 points and uh, they ran away from him one by 30 points. And, uh, you know, getting that number five seed in, in division four, now they're going to have another home game. So they'll be back home on Tuesday night to take on, um, Kingsboro, the number 12 seed in the uh, in the bracket. Um, so I think that should be a, a pretty good game, you know, more of a test for for Manchester in their final home game of the season for these seniors. Uh, no common opponents against Kingsboro, but it's a team that's won 13, 14 games. You know, they can get up and down. And um, I think, like I said, it's, it's going to be a little bit more of a test for, for this Hornets team, but they're up for the challenge. That place was rocking uh, at Manchester Essex High School the other night from what I've heard and you know one of the quotes we had a correspondent there Albie Mitchell covering the game and he spoke with the players after the game and one of the kids said we're not used to playing in a crowd this loud like even even in the regular season you know they get some pretty good crowds they had a great year like I said 19 and 1 20 and 1 but uh, people are really showing out for the playoffs and that's good to see so that's a, obviously a huge advantage to be playing at home for another round and um, if they do win that, let me just tell you, if they do beat Kingsboro, they're going to move on to play. Bear with me. I had this earlier. I just can't think of it off the top of my head. So they would move on and they would likely play Millberry, um, which is the number four seed in the bracket right above them, went 17 and five this year. Another team that probably doesn't have any common opponents, but uh, nonetheless, Great season still going for Manchester, and we'll see how they do on Tuesday night. And then uh, over in Division 5, Rockport, first tournament appearance in 14 years. They get their first playoff win in 14 years against uh, a neighborhood house charter team from Dorchester that was really athletic, really quick, and had a, a kid that was averaging 33 points, one of the uh, leading scorers in the entire state. Um, and he lived up to it. I, I was very impressed with him. He was he was shooting from the logo, as they say uh, in the NBA, you know, Steph Curry <laughs> range and just pushing him down. Um, he got hot there in the third quarter, but he got in a little bit of foul trouble. And their their plan was to lock him up. You know, he was their offense and he wasn't afraid to shoot. And I thought Rockport did a really good job of that, um, held him to 20 points and he ended up fouling out late in the game and that's when Rockport kind of put the nail in the coffin and ended up winning by 15 but uh another great environment there huge win for the program to get that uh monkey off their back so to speak and get their playoff win um yeah I thought the team defense was terrific they had a good game plan against that kid Avon Rhodes was his name the guy that averaged 33 points uh you know Josh Silva took it upon himself to to take that matchup and did a really nice job, even drew a charge on him to, to get him out of the game late. So Rockport's moving on. They had four guys in double figures in that one, really balanced attack. And they're going to move on to play number six, Drury, uh, way out in North Adams. About a three-hour bus ride for the Vikings. I think they're leaving the school at 1 a.m., 1, 1, 1 p.m. <laughs> on Wednesday. Four. Yeah, take it, a, take it a coach bus down there. So um, great opportunity for them. You know, uh, I don't know what you guys can say about the first round matchup because Drury did beat Salem Academy, uh, who was the 27th seed. Drury's the number six, Rockport's 11. Drury won against Salem Academy by seven points. So I think that bodes well for Rockport. Definitely a matchup they uh, they can win. And if they're able to pull it off on the road, they're going to move on to the Elite Eight, which is, again, just massive for this program. So even if they don't move on, terrific season for them. But I like their chances 
They're playing really good team basketball and uh, they just are ready to play. They hung 28 points on neighborhood house in that first quarter uh, in the first round game. So you can tell they're just, they're ready to go as soon as they hit the court. We'll see if that three hour bus ride plays any sort of a role in that. But uh, my guess is that they'll be, uh, they'll be ready to go. Yeah. they had that offer. Say, This is where in the state tournament, you know, night games, uh, I mean, that's a long bus ride to get out there. You know, you're going, you're basically going to the New York border. Right. You got to get off, uh, stretch out, you know, do your thing or whatever, and then play in a state tournament game. I mean, that, that's that's a tough ask. And I know it happens all over the state, and the teams from Western Mass certainly come out this way more often than vice versa, but that's that's a tough ask. Are there six hours of basketball movie? I mean, I guess if you lose, you don't want to watch basketball movies on the way home, but you know, <laughs> it sticks out. I mean, you, you got to get Hoosiers in there, and then what? Like a uh, Space Jam <laughs> one and two, uh, and uh, you know, the Sixth Coach Man. Garden. Like, uh, you know, are there enough basketball films to, to maybe yeah. you can watch the Last Dance? Maybe 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 the, just the go fish. through the episodes of the Last Dance there and back. You watch uh, the Fish That Say Pittsburgh. That would be one you could watch. Uh, Coach what's Garden. that new? Um, what, what's the newish Adam Sandler movie? Um, where he's oh sc- yeah. That was a good one with the. That was a good movie with the guy from that played for the Celtics for a little bit there, Ernie Gomez. Uh, I have no idea about that, but <laughs> did, yeah, isn't there one with Ray Allen? What's his? It's Spike Lee or something. My, you know, shout out to Mike Grinier. Yeah, Mike Grinier. Yeah, he got he got game. Jesus Shuttlesworth. Yeah, that could be a good one. Or what's the documentary from the '90s? They follow those two young guys through like high school. That was a great documentary. Um, in like the inner city of Chicago and how their different basketball journeys went. It was really, really good. Of course, yeah. I can't remember the name of it. No, I don't Hoop. know that one. I wish well, I we don't it. we we don't know if that bus Hoop Dreams. Hoop Dreams. Hoop Dreams. Yeah. Yeah. Hoop Dreams. Yeah. Um, it's good stuff. I know uh, again, time linking of time. We also have uh, two area teams in the D3 tournament still alive. Congrats to Salem Boys and Newburyport Boys. Uh, Still alive playing basketball. You mentioned Rockport, uh, uh, Nick, and then you got out of the Cape Ann League, Georgetown, still alive playing Lynn Tech, matching up against Lynn Tech in that D4 tournament. Uh, so a lot of things going on there as well. Is Lin- Linfield D4. still alive too? I thought What's Linfield. That? Linfield? Was, no, they, they lost. They, they lost at um, Martha's Vineyard. On oh, Saturday. they did. Yeah. Okay. First, yeah. 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 Hey, what's so. the one of girls do? Uh, yeah, that's Brian. the other one. I want to go to girls quickly, but yeah, Hamilton Wenham girls are playing tonight, being Monday, and St. Mary's girls are also playing tonight in D3. So uh, uh, playing a Poniquit. South and uh, Hamilton Wenham, speaking of bus rides, they're out to South Hadley, which is uh, at least they get to ride out on the pike opposed to Route 2. So uh, whatever. Yeah. Ain't that I like we were talking right? about that the other day that I think it's easier going west, even if it's maybe a further distance than it is going south because of traffic. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, you got all these games going on. Like Salem is playing at Old Rochester, which, by the way, there's not a town called Old Rochester. It's Mattapoisett is where the uh, high school is. A little trivia note there for you, but you guys knew that. Nice. But anyway, not. that's down on me. There's a Rochester, uh, New Hampshire, and uh, so on. New York might even be a Rochester, Mass. I don't, I don't know, but Old Rochester High School is in Mattapoisett, so uh, which is down. Uh, on another coast, the south coast of uh, of Massachusetts. So, um, I've done my research on this. Um, you have. You're right. And how about this Drury? Drury has both a boys and girls team are playing in this Sweet 16 this week. So uh, that's right. Really? Yeah. So, and that's another school that I think uh, there's no town Drury, right? That's just the name. No, nah, it can't be. Right? No, it's in North Adams. Right. Yeah. So. so. That's, there's still some more research that could be done on Drury. I get that, yeah, but uh, we'll work yeah. on that. Um, gentlemen, uh, let me see what we have for time here. Anything else? Uh, we Yeah, we got. We could still have a little bit more time. Any, what other topics do you guys want to touch on briefly here or quickly or not so briefly? Well, we saw uh, this past weekend there were some um, events happening, uh, New England Wrestling Championships where Jaden D'Ambrosio of St. John's Prep Won the New England Championship at 157 pounds. Finished the season undefeated. 
Um, I want to say he went 60 and 0 or 61 and 0. I mean, a remarkable season uh, for him. Alex Bajoris uh, finished second in the state in the heavyweight division. Um, and he lost three straight weeks at, at Division I states and all states in New England to the same wrestler, Thomas Brown Jr. from Chelsea, who's national champ at that weight class. I mean, he's just a machine, this guy. Um, now, I could be wrong, Phil, but I think. Bohoris or Bajoris, he's from Gloucester, right? I do not know that, actually. I think this this was a little tidbit that I was given, you know, uh, after the fact. So I, I believe he is from Gloucester, though. And if he is, you know. That's right. Mr. Cape Ann there, Phil. You would you got to trust Nick. Yeah, you, you I, I'm smelling stuff. a story, Nick, if that's the case. If that's the case, for sure. Um, yeah. and, and, you know, not to interrupt, but Gloucester did have two uh, – Two wrestlers go to New England's too. Both finished six. Michael Toppin at uh, I believe 190 pounds, and then uh, Morgan Penipede in the girls division finished sixth um, at 132 pounds. So both uh, both getting medals there. Good for them. That was a a great season for both of those guys and girls. Excellent. Um, what else do we have this weekend? Well, we had the state gymnastics championships, where uh, Maskinomics reign. They had won four straight state titles dating back to 2019, of course, minus the COVID season in there, but they finished second overall. I mean, they had a great showing, uh, 149 plus points, but was shaded out by Central Catholic up in Lawrence, um, which had 150. Um, end of a great career for uh, one of the great gymnasts of all time in the state, uh, Maskinom, it's uh, Bella uh, Missiura was going to Penn State. She won the uh, three of the four disciplines that the state championship. She won the all around. Danvers finished third. Danvers slash Linfield finished third uh, there. Um, so they, uh, you know, North Shore was well represented there. What else? Willie, um, Alex Jackson did well at New England's too. Uh, yeah, Alex finished fourth, uh, threw the shot 58 feet, which is uh, pretty solid. I mean, you know, nice, nice day. Top finisher for Massachusetts. Uh, we had a couple of other competitors uh, in the top uh, 10 or so. I want to say uh, Dan Padley in the 1,000 from St. John's Prep finished around 10th. And uh, Sean Moore from Danvers, a senior distance man, he finished 11th in the two-mile, 935. That was his best time, personal best, and – he, uh, you know, as, as coach mentioned to us, he he took some chances early and decided to go out fast and, and was able to maintain that pace the whole way. So uh, pretty cool uh, showing for Sean, too. Anytime you can get a PR, I mean, it's funny in track, like sometimes you're running against the field, sometimes you're running against the clock uh, and yourself. And uh, he was able to do both really well. So shout out to all three of those guys. I, I know that, um, you know, there will be a number of people from the area competing at um at the nationals, both in New York at the armory and at the new balance track, uh, over the next couple of weekends. Uh, so we'll have our eye on those. I mean, sometimes, uh, you know, those are just fun team bonding trips, the, the qualifying standards for some of the categories, you know, it's not like, uh, not like it is for the wrestling or anything, but it's still fun. So we'll see, uh, you know, who does well there and, and hopefully, uh, they enjoy the trips and, and the chances to, to, uh, compete you know, at some of those places. I, I got to imagine with the New Balance putting on an event there in Boston, there'll be more local runners, you know, wanting to be able to go to that one, right? I mean, because sometimes sometimes the trips to New York or Carolina or whatever are cost prohibitive or just tough for people to swing with schoolwork and whatnot. So I got to imagine some of our schools will be, uh, you know, flocking to Boston to, to run at that one. So that's pretty cool to have that, uh, you know, right near us. All right, gentlemen, I, I left that pause in there because I, I felt it could add a little dramatic uh, uh, it did. I was punch like, to the program. You're right. a true I professional, mean, Bill. There's no doubt yeah. about that. Do they call that a pregnant pause? Ooh, I don't know. No, that, that you know, when it's like kind of a long, drawn-out pause like that. Let's go with that. Let's just yeah. go with that. Yeah. Um, we can put that in the headline. And be sure to listen for the pregnant pause in this podcast a bit later on, you know? <laughs> <laughs> do not miss it do not miss it well gentlemen you guys are out straight for the last few weeks and you're always out straight uh for sure but uh great work uh good stuff great good information here and uh there's still a lot more to go hopefully uh in for the tournaments and for our north shore teams here in the in the tournament ahead but uh 
Always good checking in with you guys. Have a have a great week. Thanks, Thanks Bill. Bill. Thank you, Bill.